Hi, this is Thomas with Believe in the Run. And this is Meg with Believe in the Run. And this is Megan with Featherstone Nutrition. AKA Feathers. And you're listening to Fuel for the Soul podcast. What do we talk about here? Nutrition, hydration. Is there anybody here that is like qualified to talk about nutrition? Just Megan. All right, Megan, why don't you give some credentials? Some credentials, all the letters after my name. I am a registered dietitian who went on to get certified as a sports dietitian. So we can talk all about sports nutrition, sports hydration, how it affects your body, your performance, and your recovery. And we've been like talking and working with you for, I'd say, almost a half year or maybe longer. Yeah. And I have to say, you know your shit. <laughs> Why, thank you. I try. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we actually tried going to other nutritionists first and uh, it was really bad. It was weird. She knew nothing about running. Yeah. I think that brings up a good point. Like you have to make sure that whatever sport you're in, that the people who are helping you, whether it's a dietitian or a coach, like know that sport. That is just so important. Yeah. Yeah. And so that that's basically why I'm bringing that up is that we have someone here who knows something about running. So when we say something, listen up, because it's the truth. So before we dive into our listener question, let's talk about our sponsor, Inside Tracker. Thomas, what is Inside Tracker? Funny you should ask. Inside Tracker is an ultra personalized nutrition platform that uses blood work to create one of a kind, science backed action plan to help you reach your potential for better performance and a longer, healthier life. Yeah, so they were founded in 2009, and the Boston company first started working with professional athletes who wanted to see what their biomarkers, hormone, and mineral profiles look like during their training and how they could use nutrition and lifestyle to improve. Get this, they measure over 30, 30 biomarkers and recommend food and supplements to optimize things like your energy, cognition, endurance, heart health, and more. And... The really great news for you all is for a limited time, Inside Tracker is offering our listeners 25% off their entire store. Boom. Just go to insidetracker.com slash fuel. All right. Should we take uh, this week's user question? I listener would love question? to hear it. Okay. Are you going to read it? Because it wasn't, he didn't record yeah, it. Yeah, so this was not recording, so I'm going to read this question. And this is from Grant from Wisconsin. He said, hi, I have a question for the podcast on losing weight while running. I've always been a bit of a bigger runner and would like to see how my performance changed if I lost 5 to 10 pounds. However, I don't know how to go about losing weight without going into a calorie deficit, which sounds problematic if I'm currently training and need those calories to properly recover. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, first off, hi, Grant. <laughs> hi, from, Grant. From Wisconsin. Thank you for writing in. And I will say off the bat, this has to be probably one of the most popular questions that a dietitian or nutritionist gets. Am I right? This is a crazy popular topic, especially for running. Because if you think about it, so many people get into running to lose weight. A lot of people, that's why they start running to begin with. And then, you know, we all fall in love with it and we just can't stop. Um, so I think, you know, the, what I always ask people when it comes to running and weight loss and performance, we have to pick, there has to be a priority. So the priority either needs to be weight loss or the priority needs to be performance. And for somebody who has, you know, a big race build coming up, half marathon, marathon, um, you know, if we separate that out and focus on that weight loss piece before we get to when we need to focus a little more closely on performance, that works too. So it's just really thinking about our goals and really thinking about what is the most important thing to do um, instead of trying to do it all aggressively at the same time. Well, I mean, it sounds like a lot of people are confused because I look at professional fast runners and the majority of them are what I would say underweight. You know, you look at them and you're like, so the aspiration for many runners when you see these body styles is like, you're like, to be fast and to look like a runner, I've got to be stick thin and, you know, sinewy. And I, I, I hear what Grant's saying. He's like, hey, if I drop five to 10 pounds, I'll be faster. And it kind of, if you look at stuff though, it looks like that's the truth. But then we walk this fine line of danger between not 
fueling enough and then we get injured and you know trying to drop that weight how do we do this safely i think for every athlete it's different what our body composition should be so we have to look at our genetics so you know to your point thomas you know these elite runners are genetic phenoms that's how they're built they would probably be very very thin even if they weren't running and arguably their body composition is probably why they are more successful they probably have great mechanics you know their you know weight to strength ratio is fantastic for distance running um or vice versa for sprinting depending on their distance um so i think you know it's easy to look at those elite athletes and kind of emulate that body composition but it's so important that we take a step back and think about our own body composition, right? What has our weight done over our life? How about our family members? Who do we take after, right? So each one of us needs to figure out what is our optimal body composition for our training and running goals. And to your point, it's probably not stick thin. You know, if if we're under fueling to maintain a body composition that isn't sustainable for our own body type and, and genetics, you know, that's just a recipe for injury. So it really is kind of a fine line. And I do, when I work with my clients, it is trying to find what does that, what is that for you? Right. Are we already there? You know, do we need to lose a little bit of weight? And for some people, you know, the main goal might be a significant amount of weight loss. You know, maybe they have 40 or 50 pounds they've put on that they want to lose. And that obviously will be our priority before we start focusing on performance. Um, So I think it's just really individualizing it, right? You know, I hate those weight race weight calculators that are out there. I just think, you know, they, they don't, most of them don't take into account all of those little things that are so important when trying to figure out what someone's like best weight is for racing. Yeah, I have really heavy bones, so that's a I'm big bone. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so but Grant's question is, how does he uh, drop some weight during training, maintain his physical performance? Wow, there's got to be, even though I know it's going to be individual, and you probably have to look at the individual and what they're eating, what they're doing, and how much miles they're running, and all that kind of stuff to kind of factor in the exact balance. But in general, is there a way to to know how to drop some weight during training without getting yourself in the danger zone? Yeah. And I think, you know, Grant was wondering, you know, does he have to be at a caloric deficit to lose weight? And that sounds dangerous. I think were his exact words. So in order to lose weight, we do have to be at a caloric deficit. So, you know, in order to burn the fat that is in our body, right, we need to be feeding our body less than it's using on a daily basis. So we do actually have to, you know, use the word the whole, right? We need to be a little bit in the hole from an energy intake in order to lose weight. But when we look at how do we do this in the safest way as runners is we want to make sure that we're skimming off, right? A little bit of energy on a daily basis. We don't want crash diets. We don't want to crazy restrict what we're eating because that will very quickly increase our injury risk, decrease our performance, you know, which then if we can't run, right, that's nowhere any of us want to be, you know, injured runners are very sad runners. Um, You know, so I think, you know, skimming that energy off each day is important, but then also, you know, the timing of when we're trying to undercut fuel a little bit is important too. So for example, let's say Grant runs in the morning. So he gets up, I don't want him fasting. Let's eat before we run. Let's run. Let's come back and make, you know, that recovery meal, that breakfast. Let's make that everything our body needs, the protein, the carbs, the fats, all of it. Right. And then as the day goes on, maybe we try to undercut a little bit as the day goes on. So we're surrounding that great point of energy expenditure, our run with really solid nutrition. Um, And there's, they've actually done some research on this. And for women, we don't want to undercut by more than like 300 calories a day. And for men, we don't want to undercut by more than like 400 calories a day. And not that I think people should be counting calories. I think that is a recipe for more sadness. (laughs) Um, So if I have a healthy meal after my workout, and say that I was going to lunchtime and normally I have a sandwich or with a side of, you know, whatever. Is it a fruit and a vegetable? Is that what I should have? Um, the, and I just cut out the bread or something. Is that all I need to do and then have like a normal dinner? You think that's what most people think they should do, right? Like, let me cut back on some of the carbs. But from a runner standpoint, typically what I see 
people are the most successful with is if we actually try to cut back a little bit on the fat piece. So most of us are just getting a lot more fat than we need from a running standpoint. Um, we need carbs and we need the protein. So if we can kind of prioritize those things and try to choose like lower fat meats and be careful with the amount of, you know, healthy fats that we're putting into meals, we need them there, but we just don't need excess. Is is mayonnaise fat? I think it's like a hundred percent fat, right? I love it. <laughs> so you shouldn't be removing the bread from that sandwich. You should be Cheesing taking off the cheese and, and the mayonnaise. Mm. Perfect. Love it, Meg. Ugh. How are you going to swallow? <laughs> oh, he said <laughs> mustard. There's a delicious okay, condiment. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't really. A little help. bit of hummus. Yeah. Mustard. Oh, hummus. Yeah. There we go. All right. So Grant, to answer Grant's question, is. If he wants to be smart about it, he should just skim off some calories, maybe take out 400 from his diet right now per day, but make sure that he's getting something in his tank a little bit before he runs. And I'm, I'm neglectful of that. I don't always fuel before my run. I often go out, you know, fasted or with a cup of coffee or something like that. And then, uh, go for my run, then eat my, uh, breakfast afterwards. But in this case, you're saying, have a little snack before you go out, whether it's your graham crackers, whether it's some form of carbs to just get your engine running. Come back, have a nice, healthy meal that's a mix of protein and carbs and maybe fruit. So we often do the bake that you have on your website that you can go look up. Um, there is a little trick though, Megan. What's the trick to the bake? Oh yeah, we make the peanut butter oatmeal bake. And, you know, pre-slice it, put it in the fridge, and then in the morning, take it out and put it in the toaster oven for... It's not even a toaster oven. It's one of them fancy... Well, you use it like a toaster oven. Yeah. Like the air fryer? Yeah. It's like a toaster oven? Yeah. Oh. So it gets it warm and kind of a little crispy on the outside. Mm -hmm. So, and then you put the fruit and the yogurt on it with the maple syrup, and it's outstanding. So right there is... And you can get that recipe, I think, from uh, Featherston Nutrition dot com and so we use that as kind of like our post so that's got a lot of protein it's got your carbs it's got your um fat well not really because we use a low fat uh, yogurt but it's peanut butter oh the peanut butter and then um some fruit on it so that's how we start our day so i figure if i've got a run in and that bake i'm pretty good and then the rest i just kind of wing but um you know i kind of stick to the featherston uh menu of items and then meg makes usually a Featherston uh, dinner for us. So I would say if you want to check out the website, uh, Megan's website or Feather's website, you can um, you could probably get some good ideas for ways in which to make these healthy meals and then just figure out, like we said, remove a fat from, from the day. Like whether you have an ice cream after dinner or maybe you have some cheese on your sandwich or mayonnaise or whatever. So back to the timing question real quick. I know right around the run is where it's like most important. So before, during, after all of that, make sure we just are keeping the normal calories in. Is it better to skim from the lunchtime and then have a big dinner? Should we skim a little bit from both or skim more from dinner and have a bigger lunch or does it matter? So we know that hunger is the absolute enemy of weight loss. So really the important thing is not necessarily like when we're skimming off those calories, but that we're controlling our hunger for, so for some people, maybe they're more hungry mid afternoon. So we wouldn't want to cut as much there. Right. And then for some people, you know, maybe you're more hungry in the evening. So honestly, we want to try to just keep it pretty even, which I know is boring, but also just being mindful that we want to be trying to keep tabs on that hunger. Okay, cool. So, you know, that saying that abs are made in the kitchen, Sure do. <laughs> is it true that if you are thinking about weight loss or body composition, it, you really do have to focus on food rather than putting in extra miles or working out more? It has to be a combination, right? So the one thing runners have going for them is we're like furnaces, right? We burn so much energy when we're running. I mean, there's no other sport that burns as much energy as running. So, you know, caloric outputs from running can be super, super high. Right. But truthfully, when we really, really look at it, it's so much easier to eat a healthy diet to support body composition than it is to try to burn off a crummy diet. Um, so I think, you know, 
obviously the combination is the you know beautiful perfection of it all but you know i i have to agree as a dietitian that nutrition is really key to body composition changes well uh, that brings up a good question that i ask every week so i run a lot i eat decently but i'm not shredded like i'm not jacked i am kind of soft skinny we call that doughy around here. Not calling you doughy, Thomas, but that's our that's our favorite term Tell around here. <laughs> You're not doughy. Um, well, I think part of it is is genetics, right? And part of it is, you know, do we need to strength train more? You know, I don't. Is there more that we need to do from that perspective to actually be able to show some of those muscles a little bit more? I do think I, I'm started doing this stuff with Mary, and uh, I, I I forget the what's the exact name of her. Lift, lift, run, run, perform. perform. Lift, run, perform. Um, yeah, lift, run, perform. So I started doing that, and I have noticed, you know, but it's I haven't really been super consistent with it because I've had races and stuff pop mm. in and out, and so I haven't been like every week doing the double, uh, the double workouts. But I do feel like that is helping. But you said running was burning the most calories of anything, so you're saying I need muscle too. I think you need a little muscle, but truthfully, this is a whole nother thing. We could do a whole nother week on, but, um, there's some really good research too. As we increase our, our lifting, if we add a fourth dose of protein into our day, so like a bedtime, like fourth meal, really high protein, whether it's a shake or Greek yogurt or cottage cheese or some chicken or something like that, that that could potentially help. So maybe you should be our Guinea pig, Thomas. So we could All see right. how this works. So start eating a chicken right before bed. <laughs> a chicken. Yep. Couple. <laughs> All right, I'll start eating chickens and eggs and yogurt. What other things are protein? Protein shake, you know, you can do something easy. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah shake, chocolatey. All right, guys, jumping in here to remind you about our sponsor, Inside Tracker. So if you're listening before, you know already, they measure over 30 biomarkers and recommend food supplements to optimize things like energy, cognition, endurance, heart health, and more. And for a limited time, Inside Tracker is offering our listeners 25% off their entire store. Just go to insidetracker.com slash fuel. Do it. So since we're heading into very hot weather and training, is it true that if you're training in the heat, you are burning more calories because you're sweating more or are you just losing water weight? I think I have two answers for that. The first is... I do hear all the time, like, oh, I lost six pounds on my run, like thinking that we actually lost that weight, but it is not body fat. That is fluid. So that is not a true weight. Your true weight is when you get up in the morning, go to the bathroom and hop on the scale. Um, so anything we lose immediately like that out on a run is fluid. It's fluid, is glycogen. It's not fat mass, right? Um, but, you know, to your point of, are we actually burning more energy? running in the heat. I mean, there's a lot that goes into energy burn and one of it is heart rate and one of them is temperature, right? So if you think about it, if your heart rate's more elevated in the heat and you're working harder to cool yourself or your internal body temperature is getting higher, it's plausible that we're burning a little bit more energy running in the heat. I mean, I don't think it's a crazy amount more, but we probably do burn a little bit more. And also, I think we talked about this a little bit on uh, last week's episode, but you will burn more calories running hard efforts versus a slow, easy yeah, run. Yeah, we said uh, bringing the heart rate up and lowering it down. We, we brought up kind of like that orange theory hit workout uh, kind of idea. But this, I think what's fascinating about this, and we should d dive in a little deeper before we end this podcast today, is maybe body, the problem with body issues in running and how they correlate to uh, nutrition. And we kind of touched on it earlier with people saying, hey, you know, you look at the runner's body and this and that. We've heard, you know, high profile running athletes talk about problems with uh, eating disorders or body uh, dysmorphia, is that what it's called, where you, you yeah. look at yourself and you see something else. Um, how often when we're dealing with nutrition like you do, um, are you running into people who have and they want to have, well, obviously Grant's a good example. He wants to have a good performance, but he also wants to lose the weight. 
where do you find that it starts becoming um, unhealthy? This is such a delicate balance because, I mean, to tell you the truth, there's probably the, it's the exception that someone comes to me that doesn't have disordered thoughts, disordered eating tendencies, a history of an actual eating disorder. It's just so prevalent in the running community. And I think that's why, you know, I really try to promote to you guys this point earlier about recipes on my website. Like let's make sure we're prioritizing eating enough, eating well, eating balanced versus thinking about restriction all the time. Cause there's just so much out there that I need to restrict, restrict, restrict to be, you know, to your point, look a certain way so that I can run a certain way. And really trying to kind of break those associations is, is, 50% of what I do, truthfully, you know, when people come to me is really trying to solidify some good, solid nutrition, get people to feel how good it feels to be well-fueled, you know, and, and let that stick in rather than, and kind of minimize those voices that we hear in our heads, um, from more of the body, body dysmorphia or disordered thoughts or, you know, things like that with, with eating. Um, but, you know, to your point, Thomas, it's a slippery slope. Like it's, it's something that, you know, is very easy to grasp a hold of and go down, you know, a rabbit hole in a not so great direction. Um, when it comes to running and, you know, I see it all the time. It ends in injury. It ends in burnout. It ends in poor performance. It ends in, you know, never ends well. So I think it's really important if we're having those thoughts or having those associations with food that we do reach out for help and we get somebody to help us figure out, you know, what does good solid nutrition look like for me and how do I, how do I get some help, you know, both from a dietitian, but also from a mental health counselor, right? Sometimes we can't control the thoughts that are going on in our head and we need somebody to help pull those out, weed them out, help us figure out which ones are helpful, which ones aren't. Um, and then also, you know, work with somebody on the actual nutrition piece too. Do you, do you work with clients that, uh, have those issues that you work with a professional on the mental side as well to kind of mitigate or get them into a healthy eating situation? So I personally don't work with people who have an active eating disorder. I just don't think virtual, you know, nutrition counseling can do that justice. I do know some sports dietitians who do virtually, so I can, you know, certainly refer to those folks. Um, But I know, you know, from speaking with them, they have a team. So they make sure that there's that mental health therapist on board. Um, I do work with people who have a history of eating disorders and they do still have a counselor or a therapist helping them through that. And I think that's, you know, it works, it works beautifully, you know, if, if, that's yeah. our goal and that's, we're willing to commit to it. Mm-hmm. I think of it somewhat this way. Like, uh, th- you may have a pace in your head that you think you should be running. Like you, like you go out and I think we all kind of set a, a speedometer for, for our running. We're like, okay, if I run this slow, that's not good. If I run this fast, that's a really good day, but here's my, where I should be. Like you're happy in your daily runs. If you're in, in that zone, I feel like maybe that's the same way with weight. It is a runner. You start getting, I should be at this pace. I should be at this weight. I should be able to do this. Um, I I think that we put those kind of pressures on ourselves. And maybe that's one of the things is like with weight, instead of thinking about it as one single number, like I want to be 160 or one, whatever pounds you think about as a range. I'd like to be in between like, you know, so somewhat like you do with a race, you say, okay, if I come in, within my pace range, I should do okay. And maybe that's another way to look at weight. I don't know. We totally agree. And I always try to help people find that. And it's at least a five pound range, at least, right. Maybe higher for somebody who's a little bit bigger um, because there is so, you know, you're dehydrated, you're retaining fluid because you ate something salty. Like there's just, we're never going to be the exact same number. And if we try to stick to that exact same number, it's not going to go well. So I think, you know, having that range is so important. And I do, I help people figure out what is that health healthy range for me? Because as we said, those calculators are crap sometimes. So, you know, looking at somebody's history, where does your weight like to stay? Where does it like to hang? Where has it been in the past? What's the highest? What's the lowest? Where are we now? How's our performance? You know, all of these things come together into figuring out what that healthy weight range is. How does that happen? How does it, like, it does seem like your body has a thermostat where it's like, this is where I like to be. Um, is there a way to change that? Or is that just, you're dealing with that? That's where you're working with. So there's a ton of research on something called step point theory, that our body has a spot that it likes to be. And no matter what we do, it's going to get back there. Um, 
I don't know if I 100% buy into it, but it's a very strong theory that's out there. Um, I do think there's places that people's body likes to hang, but I do think that changes over the years. You know, personally, it changed dramatically for me after kids, right? And I think that happens too. There's points in your life that I think that's that point, quote unquote, if we're going to use that word, you know, can change. But I think we just need to be realistic as to, you know, if we've never been, you know, 140 pounds in our life, why do we think we should try to get there to run faster? You know, we've never weighed that. We've always weighed more than that or whatever the number is. Um, so I think it's just important to take all that into account and listen to our bodies. Right. So that's the whole point. I think that you're saying, Thomas, is um, if our body is telling us like breaking when we stay at a certain weight, if we're constantly injured at a certain weight, maybe that's not a healthy weight for us. You know, so really trying to figure all that out. All right. So how would we, how would we kind of give Grant's uh, question, you know, a, a full wrap up? Mm -hmm. So I think first Grant and anybody else who's in the same boat, we want to prioritize what's the goal right now is the goal weight loss or is the goal performance. So I would really highly encourage us to pull that, you know, more aggressive weight loss goal outside of a training cycle. Um, if we're doing a training cycle, if we're trying to complete our first marathon, right. And it's literally a completion goal. Maybe we can still continue to lose weight through things like that. But if we're, if it's a true performance goal, we're trying to PR, we're trying to BQ, we're trying to break three, you know, weight loss has no business in, in that equation. So I think first and foremost, we need to figure out what do those goals look like and which one do we want to focus on would be the first one, um, kind of take away from that. And then, you know, number two would be the execution of it. How are we going to do it? right? Is this something we feel like we're confident trying ourselves? Is it something we need to enlist, you know, a sports dietitian myself, or there's so many great sports dietitians out there to work with, um, to help with those types of things. Um, and I think then step three would be really listening to our bodies and noticing, noticing how we feel through this process. Cause like we said, we don't want to be hungry. We don't want to have low energy. We don't want to feel miserable on our runs. So really, you know, figuring out what that goal is, Who's going to help us execute it and then really kind of leaning into how we feel during that process and adjusting as needed. It's an interesting one. I think that this one has so many tentacles that you could go down as far as psychological performance, nutrition, and all these things. So I was telling, so I raced the Baltimore 10 miler this past weekend and I was like, I can't help but think these girls that are beating me. There was, there was probably, two women beater and one came in second overall. But my point was, I can't help but notice that these girls are probably 10 to 20 pounds lighter than me. You know, coming from my standpoint, I think that's a very normal, logical thought to have in a race when people are wearing crop tops and shorts, you know what I mean? And everyone's bodies hanging out everywhere. Um, I think that's a normal, normal thought to have. But, you know, the thing that I challenge you and anybody else who's thinking like that is think of how far you've progressed in your performance over the last two years. I mean, you are crushing every distance you run and getting faster and faster and faster. And have you had any injuries? No, no, you've totally stayed. Knock on wood. I know. I'm not going to for you too. <laughs> and, and when Megan, Megan came in third place at this race, it was hilly and it was in the seventies and it was very humid and like you said, Megan's performances, she wants to be in first place. And you will. So I, I'm guessing <laughs> Megan's like, I need to drop 10 pounds to be in first place. Well, it's just like, there's clearly a common denominator here and it's that they're tiny and it part it mentally, I'm like, can I compete with that? But see, this is where I think there is some body dysmorphia going on in this household. <laughs> Cause Megan, you're tiny. You're, you're mm -hmm. really tiny. Like Megan won't wear a crop top and she has abs. It's probably going to happen this summer because it's just too hot. I'm telling you, man, like pop out a couple kids and you just don't care anymore. It's like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you want to see my stomach? Sure. <laughs> uh, All bets are off. No, but I think it, it, it goes back to that genetic comment too. I would be willing to bet that these females are just been tiny and scrawny and running their whole lives. Right. I mean, I think we just have to be honest with ourselves and happy and, and proud of what our body can accomplish with what it's given us, you know, yeah. um, and just try to have faith in that. Right. And try to kind of quiet those thoughts because, 
you know, at some point they become unhelpful if we're not feeling our performance well. Um, but also give yourself some grace, you know, it's okay to have thoughts like that. It's just, let's try not to, you know, act on them. All right. So thanks Grant for sending in your question. We're learning alongside with you. Obviously we uh, love to hear Feather's opinion on all these things because we get to take it. It's like a free class for us. So thanks for the question, Grant. I think it's helpful. I think it will translate well to a lot of different runners out there, male, female. So thank you for the question. And uh, thanks to our sponsor inside tracker and thanks to all the listeners. And Megan, thanks as always for your intelligence and knowledge that you drop on us every two weeks. Thanks for all your questions, guys. Keep them rolling in. We love to hear your questions because then we get to talk about fun things. Hey, if you have a question and you want it answered here on Fuel for the Soul, go ahead over to the Anchor app and record your question. If you don't want to have your voice recorded and played on the show, you can be like Grant and send in your um, question via email. And make what's the email address? It's fuel for the soul podcast at gmail.com. Awesome. So that's a great way to get your question answered, and we'll hit it up. 